questions. You, are you willing to do questions now? Is that, is that okay? Sure. All right, you've had more in your share. Your turn. <laughs> Can't let these smart guys have all the time, right? You'll get, I, I, I want to get back to you. I'm kidding with you. You know that. Please. Thank you very much. It was fascinating hearing somebody talk about uh, some of these things. That, you know, I think everyone here has read about, like the Republic of Minerva and, and things like that. And I wonder, um, as somebody who's been at the State Department while these issues were discussed, um, what do you suspect the, um, the uh, reaction um, of the State Department, of the government of the United States will be to attempts at creating autonomous units um, what do you think the key dangers are, um, and what do you think the key triggers will be that will that may um, convince the federal government that it wants to get involved in shutting these things down? Well, I think there there are two kinds. I mean, it, if they're doing it, then it's you know it's wonderful. They didn't not do it in the Persian Gulf because of concerns about whether Iran would be offended. What you're, I think, asking is what would it take to get a floating city, let's say, in the contiguous zone off here, right? Well, what I think, the way I would do it, is I would go talk to the relevant authorities. I would sit down with the Coast Guard and say, this is what I want to do. I'm not a, I'm not a terrorist organization. I'm trying to solve a social problem that our national government obviously is not coping with. And uh, uh, I want to know what I got to do to be a good citizen that you would welcome. Because if you're going to be going back and forth, you're going you're gonna to be engaged in coming landing in the US. And even if you kept your, your plastic surgeons you know, offshore, uh, you're still going to be doing a lot of interaction with the US. So if you want to be off the US, I, I, I don't think you should try to outsmart them like they did in the US v. Ray case or something. But you might find it a lot easier to operate off Texas. But John? <laughs> yeah, the, the uh, outsmarting them is not going to happen. And besides that, you don't want, you know, 14 years of litigation. You don't want the you know, he, United, he does. Oh, you know, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, <clears throat> you definitely want to talk. You want to think through the issues. Uh, the the uh, uh, cases, they're not replete, but there, there are a number of gambling ship cases that go back into the 19th century. The Rex uh, made the career of Earl Warren, who later became Attorney General. Of, uh, he was Attorney General of California, but he later became great liberal chief justice of the United States Supreme Court, but he was a rock'em, sock'em, you know, put the Japanese in internment camps, and, uh, but, and he gloriously boarded a gambling ship that was four miles uh, offshore in San Pedro Bay, thinking that they had evaded, they had very cleverly done this, and uh, the case is People versus Strala, it's a California Supreme Court decision in the 19... 1940. No, you're within San Pedro Bay. You're in internal water. So I definitely agree with Myron. You know, you think you think through things and uh, and then go talk to the relevant authorities. But complicating matters. Something I forgot to mention earlier. When you're talking about California and you have the same strange phenomenon with Florida and with Texas. In okay, the Gulf. In in the Gulf, the Florida, the Gulf side of Florida. When you sail out the Golden Gate. When do you leave the territory of the United States? Everybody knows. 12 miles. Question. Fair lines. Hmm? Fair lines extended. Well, the fair lines, you have another 12 miles around the fair lines, but you, you enter international waters at, at 12 nautical miles, not statute miles. When do you leave the state of California? Three nautical miles. So from three nautical miles to 12, you are no longer in the state of California, but you're in the United States. What's the status of that strange nine-mile belt? Well, it's sort of like, kind of like, Guam or the CNMI or the U.S. Virgin Islands. It's territory of the United States, but there's no organic law governing it. 
I mean, it's every bit as much the territory of the United States, again, as this, but it doesn't belong to any state. Texas is weirder. You go nine miles into the Gulf out of Galveston, and, and at nine miles you leave the state of Texas, but you're still in the United States for another three. So these are some of the complicating factors. And some California laws apply beyond the territory of the state of California, and some don't. So. Jeff. You had your hand up. Yeah, I probably should use the Question for Myron. Do you, do you agree, and am I hearing John correctly, that the, uh, the main impact of the law of the sea treaty would be um, not in conventional law or customary law, but in seabed mining? So is that, am I interpreting your, your statement correctly? It, what are the facts? I mean, tell me the location, tell me the activity, and I can start to give you some legal counsel. Right. <laughs> well, we, we, okay, so I, one thing that John didn't make clear that, that we, he, he I made nothing clear. Yeah, <laughs> he, yeah they got, a, got a hire a lawyer, right? Uh, look at, uh, in 1990, it's true Reagan opposed the deep sea bed mining provisions, but there was a substantial revision. Mm -hmm. They had the, the, the five items that Reagan had said he couldn't stand and uh, the, the international community renegotiated and in 1994 they came out with a new, uh, they, they, hmm. they call it a, they, they don't call it a, an amendment of the convention, but it is an amendment that made the existing regime that applies now uh, okay for the U.S. But they only have resource jurisdiction out there and so they don't have any rights in the water column. But if you're doing something in the water column, like affixing your anchors to the bottom, then you know you can get the U.S. V. Ray again, and they can say, well, even though it's de minimis, you know you're you're under you're touching our jurisdiction. Sorry. Let me try to ask a better question. Um, what would be the impact for seasteads that were beyond 200 nautical miles from anyone's uh, land if the law of the sea treaty passed? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't happen to agree with, with John that it makes a heck of a lot of difference. Uh, you, you're not going to escape the jurisdiction because if you're on a, a vessel, you're going to be under the flag state. The advantage of, of being under a flag state is that you can pick your flag state. Liberia. <laughs> no, I, I, I probably find one that didn't have as well developed a legal regime. <laughs> but anyway, the point is that you, you, if you go under the U.S., you get a whole ton of stuff because they want them to have, you know, U.S. employees. Oh, they, I bet everybody can hear me. Did anybody miss any of that brilliant? <laughs> Good. They didn't miss anything brilliant. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway, I, I guess I've, I've tried to answer. Do you want to add that? No, I, I do agree. Uh, that it probably, at, at the end of the day, doesn't make much difference. But right now, the official United States position, that let's suppose, like the Glomar Explorer, that you posed as a mining operation, all right, and you were American flag. The official position of the United States today is you can go out there and deep sea mine all you want. That remains the official United States position. Uh, in 94, when the rest of the world got together and kowtowed to us. Uh, we're still we were still pretending as if we were interested in seabed mining. That's the irony of this whole, this, this feint has been driving this thing. In 94, the countries of the world got together and they agreed to hammer out this annex to the treaty that solved our, that allayed our concerns about seabed mining. Basically it was, it's the camel's nose in the tent of global welfare. Okay, we've got to share technology and share half the resources of the area and so forth. Then President Clinton signed the treaty, sent it to the Senate uh, about uh, August, and a funny thing happened in November. The Republicans took over the Senate. Jesse Helms became the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and there was no way that treaty was ever going to get to the floor of the Senate. We're still, we're still there today. But... <clears throat> that's, that's the main difference. The United States has taken the position that everything except Part 11 is customary international law. But you cloak yourself in seabed mining and 
with today's regime and maybe you're in great shape. I, again, I, I, I don't think that's true. The reason is, particularly with this administration, uh, they don't want to have a seasteading yeah. bunch of citizens that are condemned for day after day at the UN saying what a bunch of bad people, you know, corporations are non, well, you'd have to be a you have to give if you're non profit status if you went into that end of things. But that, that, that you won't have support from the government uh, for doing something, uh, in my opinion. I, it just is. The, the, we have these arguments that are made even now saying, what do we need this treaty for? If you have any right wing friends, I mean, and I got a lot of them, they, uh, they, they say, we don't need to have this treaty. We'll just go through and let anybody try to stop us. But I have the advantage of having been in the State Department, and I know what a bunch of wimps there are, and they aren't about to incur the wrath of uh, the Indonesians by going through, uh, uh, or, or let alone blasting their way through. But there are, some, there, are, there are some things that I think will possibly kick into play if we become a party, but I don't really think it's going to affect. That's my opinion. John. Probably, probably we talk a while and we come to agreement. Uh, you want? Why don't you? you do. Um, Mark has a mic in the back. Hello, Mark. Thanks. This this should be pretty quick. So um, the Bahamas and Cuba are less than 200 miles off the coast of Florida. Where do their economic zones end and the United States' zone begin? <laughs> I, I, I'll, they've got to be hammered out by agreement. And uh, we actually have an agreement with Cuba, and I think we have an agreement with the Bahamas. And it's basically something called the equidistant line or median line. Yeah. The geographers sit down with their, their dividers, and they start horsing around, and then they come up, the negotiators come up with an agreement, and then it's reduced to a treaty with, with coordinates, usually segments of straight lines or arcs of circles. And, and, I think, and I think we have agreements with both of those two Well, the, yeah, we do with Cuba, but it has never been put to the Senate. So we, uh, both sides are quite happy not to tell the public about it and abide by it, but it, it, it is splitting the difference, yeah. though, as John said. Do you want us to call out Randy or so, um, oh, this gentleman? I just had a question about the treaty again. Um, could you tell us a bit about the eminent domain provisions regarding intellectual property um, if the treaty is ratified? The treaty does not address intellectual property. Okay, does, the, does it have, I, I read somewhere that, that it has eminent domain provisions for- No, it no. doesn't. Okay. No, it doesn't. And, and I, should, I should mention, speaking of intellectual property, um, <clears throat> one of the hot issues in, in the law of the sea, some say it's much ado about nothing, as was the case with manganese nodules, um, or mang magnesium no no nodules, <laughs> as Craven would say, to try to make people think he didn't know what he was talking about, uh, <clears throat> is, is a whole new resource, uh, MGRs, uh, Marine Genetic Resources, that uh, about the time that the treaty was being hammered together in 78, I think it was in 1979, one of the Alvin expeditions discovered these rare, strange life forms at spreading centers where tectonic plates meet and superheated water from beneath the surface, uh, beneath the Earth's crust, actually makes its way up, precipitates out its load of minerals. They were first interesting because guess what? They're rich in cobalt, nickel, uh, manganese, copper, the various, and in 200 meters of depth, you know, not four miles. Uh, in very, very concentrated areas horizontally and in national jurisdiction. More recently, the pharmaceutical companies have been fascinated with the genetic material that these strange life forms, not requiring sunlight, um, uh, uh, clams uh, right out of Jules Verne, 12 feet wide with genetic material never seen. They're interested in it. Are these minerals which were provided for in the treaty? They're not fish, they're not seafood. They seem to be unprovided for. And their main value is the intellectual property content. Uh, what do you think is gonna happen with the various disputes in the South China Sea? And is there anything <laughs> that might come out of that that would be advantageous to? Do? Well, I'll let you, I'll let Myron speak to that 
but entire conferences. I just spoke, uh, delivered a paper on islands at the Law of the Sea Institute conference in Australia last fall. We had an entire day on the South China Sea. So it's a, and, and nobody agrees what's going to happen, but it's a hot area. You know a lot more about well, that than I do. Yeah, there, there is a time to give you courses on Law of the Sea or explain South China Sea. In a nutshell, in my opinion, the Chinese are developing a blue water navy. The Chinese receive about a third of their uh, oil that is fueling their red hot economy coming through that area. The Chinese and the Americans have a common interest in freedom of navigation, but the Chinese are too stupid to see that. But they will in due course. They have a bunch of army generals that are in charge and uh, they need freedom of navigation in some ways more than we do. So uh, in a, in a left-handed kind of way, I'm saying I think there's a common interest in having the freedom of navigation. As to the disputes that are mainly between the Vietnamese and the Chinese and between the uh, Philippines and the Chinese. The sovereignty disputes. Yeah, the, uh, the, yeah sorry. I mean, the, the sovereignty over these sometimes islands, sometimes islets, sometimes low tide elevations. Uh, the law of the sea doesn't help at all on that because it's a whole different subject. Yeah, it's a totally different subject, and delimitation mm -hmm. has different rules involved too. So uh, that isn't maybe a very satisfactory answer. It's a complicated problem, and uh, it is uh, a great concern to you know uh, Indonesia. We just had a conference mm -hmm. in Bali, uh, and uh, it, it's uh, the, the, the Indonesians, by the way, have been instrumental in keeping the cap on those problems by having informally, they call it the second tier negotiations, uh, where they have worked out some guidelines for how they deal with when conflict arises. The, the problem is always how do you get the notifications so that the adults can keep the guys with the finger, trigger fingers happy. They, what they what they are is is they're interested. They've got a little dotted line that ironically <clears throat> was was promulgated by Chiang Kai Shek, and they say they they, they never really quite fully say uh, what it is. But some of the military chess beaters there have said this is sovereign Chinese territory. They obviously don't know what they're talking about. But when you get to some of the uh, sophisticated people that understand the, the, what's going on there. The uh, Chinese tend to back off uh, and they, they don't want a confrontation with us and we don't with them. But on the other hand, you know, the Philippines isn't, doesn't have a very big navy. They're looking to have us comply with some treaty obligations if they get into a scrap. So it's, it's a very sensitive thing. The, the Vietnamese and the, and the Chinese have already been killing the, each other over these things, and they have fortified certain islands. Uh, they have military stationed on them. <laughs> Some, you know, are, are just standing like this because they're so small. But uh, the, it's, a, it's a very serious issue, and, and uh, I don't think it's going to be resolved uh, anytime soon. But the long term, long term, China wants navigation through there. A, 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 an illustration of that type of problem and that's a little easier to get your, arm, your arms around are the two islands in the East Sea or the Sea of Japan. Myron and I have advised the uh, Republic of Korea government on this, Dokdo, D-O-K-D-O, or Takeshima in Japanese, or um, what's, what's the, the Leon Court Islands. Two, two rocks and they nearly had a naval confrontation a few years ago over sovereignty over these islands. Are they Japanese? Are they Korean? So let me pose a hypothetical and thread along these lines. Um, and I'm, I'm just interested in what the legal or diplomatic consequences would be. And it's totally hypothetical, but suppose that some group, say it was an American group, went back out to the site where the Minerva, Republic of Minerva was. But went out with sufficient resources to kind of, you know, make it make it a little stable, and then with defensive resources to at least repel the Republic of Tonga, you know, or of Fijians or something. 
so that the status quo is, okay, you know, you know, they're they're there, right? And now the Republic of Tonga comes to the State Department. What happens, or in general, what does the rest of the world do in a situation like that? And supposing that there is some armed conflict or something, mm -hmm. and it's a, then it's a standoff, then what does the rest of the world do? I don't care what the rest of the world do. The Americans won't help you. But they, but they won't help the Tongans either, or they will? We're not going to interfere. I mean, let them guys fight. <laughs> that's my quick answer. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I think that's right. It's, it's, in a way, it's the opposite of what global sea level rise may do to uh, the Maldives, the Seychelles. Uh, the, the law of the sea treaty does not govern sovereignty. Okay, that's a whole other body of international law. Who owns a petite, particular piece of ground? But it is clear, the law is clear, it has to be ground. When sea level finally rises sufficiently, uh, 1.6 meters in, a, in the next 90 years is the general consensus among the oceanographers of the world. Uh, you know, the, not my view, Gary Griggs, at the, who's the chair of the oceanography department at Santa Cruz, the Scripps guys, the Woods Hole, Dalhousie, 1.6 meters, 55 inches, I think that works out too. That's going to drown the Seychelles. Legally, it won't be a country. There is no land. Now, can they build it up? <clears throat> well, the definition of an island in the Law of the Sea Treaty, Article 121, an island is a naturally formed area of land, comma, surrounded by water, comma, and uh, 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 above high tide, naturally formed. So sea level rise has got some profound ramifications for the law of the sea for these low-lying countries. If I may, this question of sovereignty, I, I think we should dig out a little bit uh, more because it strikes at the, the, uh, the very rationale behind much of the seasteading movement here. But what I gather you're saying here is that it is fairly well settled international law that if you went out with a uh, man-made structure into international waters, that you would have to have a flag on that structure that you could not become a de novo political entity. Is that correct? Can you speak to that? You want to take it? Well, well, but, well basically you have to have land to have sovereignty. That's the very serious <clears throat> problem that the Maldives, uh, Corabas, the Seychelles have. They, in the next century, may cease to be land and sovereignty has always been defined in international law as that ultimate territorial power over land. Now, an island is land, but an island must be naturally formed. So you, you create a structure, even suppose in, in the Arctic, for example, the petroleum engineers have designed these artificial islands because, say, you know, north of the Beaufort Sea, an area I'm very familiar with, build these drilling platforms, well, uh, until more recently, uh, it was icebound nine months out of the year. When that ice breaks up, it's eight, nine feet thick. It's like ships. It's going to batter the living hell out of these rigs, okay? <clears throat> North Sea technology doesn't work. Santa Barbara technology doesn't work. So they formed, they, f they, they created artificial islands uh, with alluvial material, sand and gravel, and they get locked into place by the interstitial ice. You know, the pore spaces are about 40% or something like that. After a while, they begin to behave like natural islands. But are they? It's an unknown question in, in international law. So what I'm saying is that that's, that's an example. And, and these are serious propositions because those islands out there can generate American territorial sea in the Arctic, in the Beaufort Sea, right, <clears throat> if they are islands. Now, what about a structure that you build, let's just forget about the distance from shore, you build a structure and it's actually designed to trap sediments and become land in time, right? It's got to be in shallow, you know, on a continental shelf area or a continental ridge um, <clears throat> or just uh, an atoll somewhere in the Pacific. And after a while, it begins to behave like real land, like naturally formed land, but it didn't start that way. We don't know what the answer to that question is. It's never arisen. Did, did, are you sad? Are you, did you get your answer? 
Yes, but I, I think it's a fairly disappointing answer for uh, the, the seasteading movement. Uh, in, in terms should have of paid me earlier. I would have told you what you wanted to hear. <laughs> No, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to be frivolous with you. Do you it, 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 I, I think you're either going to be the jurisdiction of a flo floating vessel or you're going to be the jurisdiction of uh, a continental shelf. You're either attached. We have the problem now. We have mobile uh, rigs that are flying under a flag when they're acting like a vessel. And then when they get affixed to the sea bottom, they come under the jurisdiction of the coastal state uh, at that point, then they can go back and be a vessel again when they're towed home. Um, it's easy, easy, right? What, what happens if, if the mobile rig goes to the high seas? And then you mean beyond the continental shelf? Beyond the continental shelf. Then you have to a deal with... I suppose a seamount that's past the continental shelf. Yeah. Then you have to look at the facts very carefully and see if you're dealing with the International Seabed Authority. They have, they have certain responsibilities for marine pollution and stuff. Uh, sure. But you're not going to get you're not going to get recognition at the UN as a no, sovereign it's country. De facto versus de jure, right? Well, de jure is what you care about. Uh, let's see, there's two. Your time. I, yeah, are we yakking on too long here? Um, five more minutes. Okay. We'll, All right. We'll, 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 we'll may we uh, may we say we'll take George and then you. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> you first. Does the law of the sea produce? compensation schemes arising from activities relative to these legacies of the common, common legacies? The short answer is no, but the in the seabed mining provisions, that's part 11 of the treaty, the idea, the, the fundamental idea was, oh, you want to go out and mine these manganese nodules or anything else for that matter in, quote, the area, you come in with two mine sites. And the other one has to have the same commercial, roughly the same commercial value as the one you wish to mine. And you've got to turn over all of your technical studies to, to prove all of that. And then the seabed authority, mind you, if you're an American today, according to our government, you don't have to do this. You don't have to go to the seabed authority. You can just go out there and mine to your heart's content. If we ratify the treaty, it's going to be different. Then you have to go to the seabed authority. <coughs> And the idea is, originally there was there was a international mining enterprise called the Enterprise that was going to mine that other site, and that revenue was to be used for the benefit of the third world, the so-called Group of 77. But I think that's the only compensation provision of, of sorts that I can think of in the treaty. Yeah, but in, in answer <coughs> to your question, I just don't think that you're going to get much support anywhere with 161 and counting nations that have signed on to the International Seabed Authority idea for going out and doing something that's going to be offensive. Again, what you need to do is, go, if you want to do something, if you want to anchor out there, go out and negotiate an MOU with them, as the international cable industry has, by the way. Yeah. I, I want to give this 95% of your internet traffic globally goes through submarine cables. It isn't off the satellites. So it's in every interest, in every country's interest to have submarine cables. Well, with 50% of the high seas on seabed that is controlled by the International Seabed Authority, made all kinds of sense for the cable industry to enter an MOU with the ISA, and they did so. And I, I would say, Again, don't go out and challenge anybody. You're probably going to lose uh, for a whole bunch of different reasons, depending upon the facts. But work it all out in advance. And by the way, that's the way oil companies operate. They don't take risks.